and um, a very warm welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand. Uh, thank you for bringing in a good crowd tonight. Be a little quiet, please. Thanks. Thank you very much. Look, um, before we start uh, tonight's discussion, much anticipated on what is undoubtedly the issue of the moment in Thailand. Um, quick uh, reminder of how things are going here. There are cameras moving around. These cameras are following Cameron Forney um, for his own documentation. We're not broadcasting the event live tonight, but it will go up on our YouTube channel uh, afterwards in the next couple of days. Um, and obviously anyone here, you can feel free to take uh, photographs, but we don't have any, any live broadcasts going out tonight. So you've got exclusive access to it. Um, anyone who's not a member of the club, could you please consider joining? We do need more membership, um, and the club's life is its members and its membership. So if you're not a member, think very hard about it. It's very good value, and our events are unique here in Bangkok. Um, we've also got a couple of um, events you should think about coming up in the next two or three weeks. We've got um, uh, an event on the Eastern Economic Corridor and all its potential and the work that's being done on it now to be Thailand's next big growth area on the 22nd of July. And we will be having some the senior officials involved in that project coming in to tell us how it's going. On the 3rd of August, we're planning to show uh, a film looking at Italian architecture and the, the legacy of Italian-influenced architecture here in Bangkok. Um, it'll be presented by the wife of the Italian ambassador who scripted this film. Um, and it's a fabulous look at this really quite unique heritage in Bangkok. It's a strong imprint. Much of the statuary and the monuments uh, and many other buildings in Bangkok were in fact designed by Italian architects and it's a, a legacy that the Italians are very proud of. But let's get straight to tonight's event. Um, nobody who's been in Bangkok or anywhere near in the region could have missed the uh, uh, dramatic change in the law here that took place last month. Um, it is very much the work of Kun Anutin Chan Wirakun, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Public Health, and we're very, very pleased and honoured to have him back at the club. He's a friend of this club, he's spoken here before, and he's given up his time to come tonight to talk about a policy that he presented as a key part of the election strategy for his party, Bum Jai Thai, back in 2019. It was a very successful and distinctive election campaign, but more than that, Kun Anutin's been able to go back to his voters and say, I've delivered on the policy, I've delivered a law that is, uh, by many standards, one of the most liberal marijuana regimes you will find anywhere in the world. It puts Thailand right at the head in this region of a booming new economy. And of course, uh, for those who you know, know this region well, it's a striking contrast to the rather punitive approach to drugs that has been taken um, in previous years. And it'll be very interesting to see whether other countries follow up. It is, of course, potentially a huge business. Um, I'm going to run through the speakers. Kunanitin needs no introduction. Um, it's fantastic he's here. Um, next to him is uh, Tom Crusapon on his left, who has been involved in, in promoting the potential of the cannabis business for a very long time in Thailand and uh, is a key player here. Um, we also have next to Tom is uh, Kitty Chopaka, who's, uh, for anyone who knows about the campaigning for cannabis and for the liberalization of the laws, Kitty is a very, very familiar figure. She's been pushing for a long time um, for the liberalization of laws. We've got, uh, on Kwananitin's right, uh, Cameron Forney. We're very lucky to have him. He's only in town for a short time. He's one of the leading entrepreneurs in North America. Um, has been one of the most successful entrepreneurs. He's the... Um, um, has been previously the CEO of Cura Cannabis Solutions and is founder and president of Select Oil, um, which is the best-selling cannabis brand at the moment on the U.S. West Coast. Um, but he's going to be talking about what he's learnt from the way in which the business has grown in North America and what lessons there are for Thailand, to things, lessons they can follow and things to avoid. And last but definitely not least, Gloria Lai is the regional director for the International Drug Policy Consortium. And I think people need to remember that much as people are talking about the business opportunities in cannabis now that it's been legalized, a lot of the thinking behind the change in the law was, came from um, criminal justice reformers like Gloria who were arguing that putting people in prison for very long periods of time was not a suitable approach to dealing with drug use. 
Um, Thailand's prisons, about 75 per cent of prisoners are there for drug offences, many of them very minor. And one of the great benefits of this new law is that thousands of people will now get out of prison. And we're going to be talking to Gloria about that campaign and about what else she wants to see. So without further ado, Kunanutin, the floor is yours. Please tell us about your hopes for this policy and, and, and why you pushed to change the law. Thank you, Jonathan. Good evening, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored and delighted every time that I can have a chance to come here at FCCT, for which I remember that the food is so good. This time I come here to connect the dots of an incomplete picture where I left on this stage three years ago. Back in year 2019, the guy on my left, which is the person I hate most in this country, Tom Krisopon, both himself and I were here to paint the picture of the future of cannabis in Thailand. And Mr. Jonathan Hitz was here moderating the stage as well. It was then just a vision, but now it has become reality. So we have gone through obstacles of every size. Now we are facing another challenge, and I'm hopeful that it will be the ultimate challenge. But to me, whenever I have to go through any transition, especially, especially on things that I have to supersede the old game, I will, I, ha I will have to always face with this kind of challenge. So it is usual. It uh, makes no uh, different than other things that all of us have at least experienced in life. So I'm here today to summarize to you of where we are right now and what is next about cannabis business. And as the leader of Pum Jai Thai Party, my principal task of being a politician cannot be otherwise but to make sure that our people well-being and uh, quality of life must be improved. And I mean both improvement on physical and financial well-beings. After years of gathering information and studies from all over the place, a majority of those papers that we, have been, we had been collecting clearly shows the benefits of cannabis usage for those who suffered the dreadful diseases such as cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, insomnia, or even stress and chronic pain. My party was certain that cannabis plants would be the next economic booster crop for Thailand and would eventually enhance our country's image as the well-being and medical hub of Asia and beyond. Despite the long history as being herbal medicine in the ancient period, cannabis in Thailand was buried underground when it was declared and classified as narcotic. Using the herb to heal people became criminal. Patients struggled to receive the treatment from cannabis medicines, as well as those dedicating doctors were at high risk of being prosecuted and sentenced to imprisonment. So through these past three years of hard working and fights, the Ministry of Public Health was able to officially remove cannabis plan from the list of the narcotic drugs since June 9th, about four weeks ago. Thailand has opened up the opportunities for businesses and medical industries. Farmers have then been able to earn revenues by planting cannabis crops and supplying all parts of the plants 
as raw materials to numbers of products ranging from traditional medicines, modern medicines, food additives, beverages, up to cosmetic and toiletry and household commodity products. Only the extract, and again, only the extract, not the flowers, not the trees, not the roots, only the extract of over 0.2% of the growth weight that contains uh, THC and the importation of all cannabis products from outside the country remain illegal. So per se, the whole plants are no longer narcotic, especially when uh, they are grown in the country. And you can see that public interest has been and is still overwhelming. We opened the online platform application called Blue Gun. Blue Gun in Thailand means let's grow cannabis. The meaning is let's grow cannabis the meaning of the Blue Gun uh, application. Surprisingly, over 30 million people have scrolled through this website and downloaded the application to find information about the crop. The do's and don'ts recommendations, the clarification, clarification and procedures for registration. And this application also features online registration and approval. So far, this platform has approved of more than one million licenses over the past four weeks. So this clearly shows the level of enthusiasm from the people. Now come the challenge. Alongside with this enthusiasm from a big part of the society, there are also worries and criticisms from people who truly don't understand the benefit of this policy and people who grudgingly resent cannabis since it was perceived as being narcotic material for such a long time. The major concern is about the use of cannabis for recreational purposes. I'm here to assure you that the rec recreational use, especially in the form of smoking, puffing has never been our desire. And we dis discourage all recreational uses of cannabis that could lead to physical and mental damages. There are always parentheses. We focus only on using cannabis for medical and health purposes. Measures to prevent the misuse of cannabis products have been initiated and with underlying penalties for those who use in the wrong way. We listen to all concerns as we already know way in advance that this would happen. We are prepared to be flexible in our approach and adjust to the situation to ensure that the goal is met with minimum turbulence. Unfortunately, Due to COVID issue, the, the Cannabis Act could not be finished prior to the date that we free cannabis from narcotic cell. I anticipate the next question from the public will be why I didn't wait until the law was enforced. No, no way, no sir. I won't wait. I would never delay, even if I could turn the clock back, because there were patients waiting to choose their treatments with herbal remedies, namely cannabis, cannabis oil and related medicines with cannabis as part of ingredient. There were farmers waiting to harvest and get their first crops, awaiting their incomes during current economic difficulties. 
There were SME businesses, investments, plannings, and deals that are ready to get going. It would be unfair if the government would cause this damage to these decent people where it could put efforts in using other measures or mechanisms at hand to manage this gap. The said mechanism is the regulation in the form of the ministry's announcement with the consequences linked to criminal law with the purpose to protect children and adolescents under the age of 20. I have put cannabis under the controlled herb classification with the prohibition of smoking in public, in public, and prohibition of distribution to those under 20, to, to pregnant and nursing women. Anyone fail to oblige with such rules may lead to being uh, charged with legal action. The Cannabis Act has passed the first stage of the parliament consideration. That's the first stage. It is now in the second stage where a group of commissioners has been elected to amend and conclude the Cannabis Control Bill and propose to the House for the final endorsement. This is expected to be done sometimes in August or later September. For the time being, until the bill becomes effective, the Prime Minister has appointed the Cannabis Policy Committee, in which I share, to monitor the transition and control the use of cannabis in lieu of the cannabis law. And there is also a working group to promote the information and knowledge related to the cannabis use. We emphasize on promoting well-being and the quality of life. This remains our goal, and it will certainly be reflected in the upcoming law. How would the future look like? For sure, patients of applicable diseases will all have access to the cannabis as their medical treatment, which is much more affordable than other alternatives. There will be more research and development with regard to cannabis in the country, and opportunities are unlimited. Prisoners convicted with cannabis-related charges will be released from imprisonment due to cannabis being liberated. Economic, economically, we project that the cannabis industry in Thailand will be worth over $3 billion, a coincident with uh, Cameron's number that he just showed me, within the next five years. Our country will certainly be the hub for alternative health care and well-being. Beneficiaries from this policy are among the people of every classification, from farmers to industrialists, from workers to entrepreneurs. This is just to name a few. Thailand has a lot more to offer in the field of health care and well-being. Cannabis is one of the countless possibilities. The rest is to be unfold as opportunity arises. So this is what I wanted to present to you this evening. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Kunanutin. It's um, obviously a very personal policy for you as well. And um, you know, it's very much in the spotlight. But I, from what I can see, it's still enormously popular. Ties clearly see em enormous potential in this policy. Gloria, could I ask you to um, give your own thoughts on this I mean, with your background and having been campaigning for so long for a different approach to drugs and criminal law? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do I need to turn this on? Or? You're right, it's on. I'm, it's on. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> thank you very much, Minister Anutin. It was really wonderful to hear from you and, and all that you have done to fight for 
the betterment of the health and well-being of people in your country. Uh, we work at regional level um, and international level, but I focus in Asia. Um, and some of the most punitive, some of the most brutally punitive policies in terms of drugs are to be found in Southeast Asia. So from use of the death penalty, um, certainly overcrowded prisons, disproportionate sentencing, where even drug rehab centers um, are really abusive. Um, and it's really great to have Thailand to refer to as an example. And for a lot of colleagues in other countries, I actually look to Thailand with a lot of interest. And I think we're excited to see um, other considerations, this, how this would trigger changes in other parts of the region. Um, can I say, I think especially for cannabis reforms, it's exciting to see this kind of reclaiming of a culture and tradition um, in Thailand, because a lot of the drug laws found here and elsewhere are a colonial legacy. Um, cannabis, for example, was not always prohibited or criminalized. It actually came through in, the 19, in 1943. And a lot of that pressure for that criminalization and to take a heavy, pun heavily punitive approach came from the United States in particular. Um, so it's kind of ironic in a way that the US, so, so particularly a number of US states, are championing um, the legalization of cannabis. Um, Thailand before in Southeast Asia we, is a priority country for us. Um, up until recently, it had the largest prison population in Southeast Asia. It has the la one of the highest rates of female incarceration in the world, um, and for both men and for women, over 80%. So before the prison population was at over 300,000. It's a really high number, right? Um, it's really great when the cannabis reforms happened and it led to, I think, around 3,000 people being released from prisons. Um, convictions of over 4,000 people expunged. 3,000 out of 300,000 is a small proportion, but 3,000 people is still a lot of people. Um, and I, I think I wanted to highlight also that actually it's not just beyond cannabis that Thailand has pursued really extensive reforms to drug laws um, in the past one year. Um, the legalization of Gratom came through last year. Um, and Gratom is something that is also widely used um, illegally though in Malaysia, Indonesia, um, and with big markets in the United States. Um, that also led to the release of, I think, over 12,000 people from prison. But the majority, so what about the other, the remaining over 200,000 people in prison? Most of them are in prison for methamphetamine. So when you hear a lot of the reports from the UN around the illegal drug markets here and from the Golden Triangle, it's mostly about methamphetamine. And just like cannabis and gratom, there are medical purposes and there are functional purposes. Why do people use methamphetamine. I think just like Gratom and just like for cannabis, it's to ease pain. Um, and it can be also just to help them stay awake. People have to work long hours. People have to drive long distances. Um, they don't earn a lot of money, so they need to stay awake for longer. And so a large proportion of people who use methamphetamine are for those functional purposes. And so the, not these kind of broader drug law reforms were adopted in December. I mean, they are adopted earlier, they came into effect in December. And it came in the form of a narcotics code. And the rhetoric from the government was a real about turn. The government was saying, we cannot say that we are winning the war on drugs. We are failing, and so we need to change approach. We, there was a recognition from the government that most people in prison are there for low-level drug offenses. They are using, they are merely possessing or engaged in low-level dealing. The sentences, the penalties were disproportionate. They were too extreme and it's too easy to sentence someone to prison for life or even get the death penalty just for possession of a relatively small quantity of drugs. And the government said that with the new narcotics code, they wanted to make a strong distinction between people in the low end of the drug market so that they could focus law enforcement resources in the high end of the drug market. 
there was a strong talk about shifting towards a health approach to drug use. And I think all these changes are really positive and they're really in line also with what Minister Anutin is trying to pursue around taking a health approach. There are, in the changes in the drug law, there are alternatives to incarceration that are put in so that judges are less likely to sentence someone to prison or even a long term of imprisonment um, for low level drug offences. But it's disappointing to see that the government, even though it says that it's changing its approach to a health approach, that it fell short of decriminalizing consumption. So you see under narcotics code, there is still a maximum one year penalty for consumption and two years plus a fine for possession of any quantity. And I think in relation to cannabis, I mean, Minister Anutin talked about there, are, there is a portion of cannabis extracts that are more than 0.2% that will remain in the narcotics code. And I think we're really interested to see when the detailed regulations come out, how extracts exceeding 0.2% are going to be defined. Because it means that whatever is considered to be over 0.2% THC can then come under those penalties. One year maximum for consumption, two years for possession, plus a fine. I mean, under the drug laws, there's an encouragement of referring people to drug rehabilitation instead of prison. But the problem is that the drug rehabilitation facilities in the country, many of them are run by the military or the police, um, and there are many complaints of abuse. So I think we're really also curious to see how the Ministry of Health will take leadership in transforming provision of drug treatment and rehabilitation. Uh, for people who are dependent on drugs, as well as providing health and harm reduction. I think the approach, how the approach is being taken to cannabis is really great because you're really championing the rights of people to have access to substances for medical purposes and to advance their health and well-being. And I think we'd really love to see that kind of rational approach taken to other substances, in particular methamphetamine. I'm not saying that we're not, not saying that it should be legalized, but if the government is taking, but taking a health approach would mean seriously reconsidering the role of police and the role of law enforcement in this. Under the narcotics code, police are still given authority to identify people who use drugs. We went to a conference recently where the Royal Thai Police representative talked about a new initiative that they've started with local government around knocking on people's doors, identifying people who use drugs so that they could be sent to drug rehab. But when we talk about a health approach, that is not a health approach. Police are not, police basically forcing people into a, some kind of so-called health program is not a health approach. So we, that would be one of our strong recommendations. I think maybe I'll, stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria. A reminder there of, of what is at stake. Um, I'm going to move on to Cameron Forney. Before I do, can I just remind those of you around the bar to keep your voices down a bit? It's hard for people to hear otherwise. If you can just hang on till the end of the presentations. Um, Cameron, um, you have more experience than anybody in this room. Um, you've seen how it's gone in the States. You've done very well. Let's hear your lessons. Thank you. And Thank you very much for, for having me, and uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. And Minister Noon, thank you so much for uh, doing that for your country. You know, descheduling um, from a Schedule One is still something the United States hasn't done, uh, which is wild. Um, they've given the states the right to decide. So each state has now gone state by state, building their own rules, building their own regulations, building their own policies, different administrations have different rights within each of those states as well. So, you know, you want to solve a Rubik's Cube 
uh, come be in cannabis in 23 states and six countries uh, and have 23 different sets of rules, regulation, packages, departments, oversight. Um, it, it can get really, really, uh, really, uh, really interesting sometimes. But I can tell you, and it's funny because we're actually the largest uh, oil and concentrate extractor in the world. So <laughs> we don't sell anything under 0.02%. <laughs> it's not possible. But um, I think one day that they, you know, eventually will, you know, I'm happy to provide a bunch of reports and white papers as well for what concentrates and extracts have done for a lot of people from cancer patients for rehabilitation to, you know, just giving people the ability to eat again. That's one of the biggest issues when someone has cancer is they stop eating, they stop getting nutrients. So it's just a very, very um, important factor. And there's a lot of different products out there um, that have done amazing things. We have several employees that we've, you know, they had cancer. We started setting up our formulations, different products, and, and they, they are cancer-free. So it's, it's very unique, um, this plant and its healing purposes. Um, so thanks again for having me. My name is Cameron Forney. I uh, founded my company in 2015, built that up, uh, and sold it in 2019. It was the largest transaction in history. It went over $1.1 billion at one point from the living room to there in about five years. Now, Cureleaf, the company that I'm special advisor to that, that purchased my company, Select, which is actually the largest brand in the United States because we're in 23 states and soon to be six countries, um, that, that brand and this company, Cureleaf, does about $1.4 billion a year in revenue at the moment, 6,500 plus jobs, healthcare for all those employees. You know, it's generated over um, uh, 500, um, $500 million in annual taxes, just one company, um, for that cannabis space, so that's very, very unique. So I'm just gonna run through a little little quick slide deck uh, that I put together. I put one of these together for almost every single market that I've been into, and uh, it's interesting, we did have the same numbers, which is which is unique, because a lot of this is, uh, a lot of it's guessing and, and it's estimation, and we, we get pretty close um, once we do it, <laughs> just depending on how those rules, regulations, policy and licensing actually shake out when the final regs come. So this is just a brief uh, kind of overview of what we're gonna go through. I'll try not to go too slow. I'll try to, try to speed it up a little bit as well. Uh, but again, just some of the states I advise in, Michigan, New York, Oregon, Arizona, California, Nevada, um, uh, Mass uh, Maryland. And this has been advising on setting uh, pesticide standards, setting uh, heavy metal standards, microbial standards, um, and uh, testing standards, because those tes testing becomes very, very important for consumer safety. Now, in the regulated market, you're not gonna have a lot of issues when you set the regulations appropriately and testing standards. If you're in the illicit market or the black market and you don't, you don't have enforcement, that's where people get hurt and that's where there's problems. So we'll run through a few of those uh, things as well. This is uh, the number one reason. The thing that we've learned in the United States is, again, if you don't have some sort of regulatory oversight or advising on public health and safety, uh, there was something called the vape crisis that took place uh, in 2019, and they were just, it was bathtub chemists. It was people that did not have a degree in, in chemistry or science or, or anything, and they were mixing you know, lotion into vaporizer cartridges. They were smoking vitamin E acetate and that caused you know, pneumonia and it caused a lot of issues. That only happens when there's no oversight. Not one legal company in any state ever had an issue like that. So it's just something we learned. There's no one in all of cannabis in the entire world that's touched as much cannabis as we have. We've touched over 80 million kilograms of cannabis testing it. And most of that fails typically when you go to our standards that we set and advise in each state. Um, and again, we've purchased and sold over 15 million kilograms um, of cannabis so far. It's growing every day. Another big comparison that people bring up is alcohol, right? Is cannabis as dangerous as alcohol? And the answer is no. Cannabis has not caused deaths. When you hear about a death in cannabis, it's because it's laced with fentanyl. It's synthetic because they don't allow regular, you know, plants to be legal. They, they have people make synthetic cannabis and that's caused deaths. There's been cutting of oil on the illicit market that's caused deaths, but never has there just been a plant death. Um, alcohol, right? You have some, some pretty significant deaths and uh, increase in violent crime. 
uh, cannabis, you typically have an increase in food sales, uh, <laughs> not, uh, not violent crimes. So that's you know, a big piece that, that we always look at when we go into this. It should be treated like alcohol uh, because it doesn't have those risk factors. Now, it should be regulated. Kids shouldn't smoke cannabis unless they have cancer or a significant chronic disease that can be helped, right? You should be 21, right? 20, you know, or older. And, and again, unless it's for potential, only medical purposes, that's what we always recommend because your brain needs to fully develop. So there does need to be some oversight. Um, and that's just some things that we kind of go through with this. Um, the Department of Revenue, what is the economic impact of cannabis and legalization? And it's huge. In the United States, it's been absolutely tremendous. Um, you can see our population, 335 million, our tourism of 80 million. You know, we're looking at, a, I have bought and then I have um, uh, uh, dollars. And if we were to go full federally legal and have a reasonable tax, not a U.S. tax, U.S. tax, they're, they're absolutely crazy. They, they tax it so hard that the illicit market actually grows and doesn't pull that money out or, or doesn't leave the money in the regulated market because there's up to 100% tax in some states, 130% tax in other states. So it makes it hard for the business to survive and it makes it hard for people to buy their medicine because now their medicine is two times, three times more expensive. So that moves people to the illicit market. And that's not what we want to do. The US is, is, is going to be a $102 billion market in 2025. And if they don't change taxes, it'll be maybe half of that, maybe half of that. So that's just kind of something that's, that's, that's interesting. I broke everything down by per, per capita spend, $304 per person in the United States. Canada, as you can see, $227. I went a little lower with Thailand of $179, but the potential market size here is 442 billion baht. Um, that's large, that's, that, that's a big market. This could be, the medical hub of cannabis and well-being for all of Asia and the tax revenue and the tourism that that's going to bring in, the jobs that it's going to create are going to be, you know, over 471,000 jobs is what we're estimating to meet this market size. So it's, it's very, very unique. It's very exciting. I've been talking with Tom for two years and he said, Cameron, I'll never guess. It just, it just legalized. So I jumped on a plane and, and here we are uh, about uh, 14 days after it. So um, another, you know, big impact that we've been learning about Thailand is, you know, there's been a, a little bit of a tour, uh, tourism shortage due to China, due to Russia. And that's, you know, a lot of people. It's 15 million people out of a 40, you know, million uh, uh, annual tourism. That's going to be a lot of cannabis dollars in tourism. When, when COVID restrictions and things open up just a little more, the amount of cannabis tourism that'll be here will be a massive economic driver for all of Thailand. Here's just a breakdown of the tax, yeah, tax opportunity. Um, if, this, if they're able to license, and if there's going to be licenses or not, you would think there would be as much as like an alcohol license. And you're saying there was over a million or two million license or people applying already. That's very, a million, a million, that's, that's huge. That's, that's, that's very, very big, a lot of interest. Um, this could be about 1.29 uh, billion baht. Uh, that's a 4.4% total increase on, on entire tax revenue of the country. So that's a tremendous economic <laughs> driver. Um, the labor force increase, 487,000 people is what we're estimating for this. Um, just with the already existing labor tax that's 65 billion baht that just immediately comes in. It's creating jobs. Uh, it's creating uh, you know, uh, uh, health benefits. It's creating uh, building. There's going to be a lot of manufacturing. There's going to be a lot of building. There's going to be a lot of uh, 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 nutrients sold. There's so many other segments and markets that you have to build out infrastructure. And our infrastructure was over 60 billion uh, spent and, and 10 billion of money coming in. So there's entire, you know, markets that I haven't even calculated for that'll be economic drivers in Thailand. Um, we are recommending implying a 15% excise tax. I've heard about a 30% tax, 40% tax, 50% tax. And I can tell you, it doesn't work. Um, it, it moves people to the black market. So it has to be a fair tax, but it has to also drive government 
drive uh, 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 government agencies. You know, a lot of our tax dollars in the U.S. goes to uh, education, it goes to the police force, it goes to disenfranchised communities, it goes to social equity, and, and those dollars are redeployed back into the community and small businesses. So it's been just a tremendous economic driver for the U.S., and we're very excited about the opportunity uh, that it could be for Thailand as well. Here is just a few things that if these things don't happen, legalization doesn't go as smooth. Regulatory oversight can be much more difficult. And I've heard several times tonight already, the genie's been let out of the bottle. So, so how, how does that work? How does it get back in the bottle? And it's as simple as, as what we were talking about. You have a, a, a simple you know, liquor license just to, to get your foot into the door, but then you have some regulations, not selling to children right, child safe packaging. So a young kid isn't able to just open it and, and, and have it, uh, the cannabis in their hands or products. Um, setting certain things up where, you know, you're, uh, you're setting testing standards. Big issues are testing. Um, extract is much larger and, and more worrisome than the flower itself. Uh, but if you don't set certain testing standards, there can be a tr some, some issues from that. And I'm gonna go through that. Here's just a look, California, your population of you know, 39 million people, there's 866 licensed dispensaries. California to reach its full potential needs 4,700 dispensaries to reach its full potential and tax revenue. What we recommend, you know, in Thailand, just if you want to really maximize the value in the per capita increase that we've seen in, you know, five countries now and 23 states is roughly 8,500 of those retail stores before it starts reaching a saturation point. Um, that's just what we've experienced in the United States. So it's just something that we thought was uh, interesting, interesting to share. Then you can also see liquor stores um, just in California alone. You know, there's a, there's a liquor store every 13,000, or there's a liquor store for every 2,700 people. And in cannabis, there's a legal cannabis store for every 43,000 people. So the U.S. needs to, or California needs to make that change and start increasing more licensing. So you don't want to see too strict of licensing or um, uh, too stringent. Otherwise, you won't maximize that economic benefit. Here's about the infrastructure required to meet that tax increase. Uh, if you want to see that market increase to that size, the 442 billion baht annual market size, you're going to need 150 plus large manufacturing, you know, and that can also be broken down by a lot of small local manufacturers, along in mom and pops, a lot of independents, um, and you are going to have about 4.4 uh, 4, uh, 4 .4 million square uh, meters of cultivation. That's about what, what the requirement was. 80 plus distributing, 45 plus testing facilities, and 8,500 stores is just based off the U.S. Now, I could be completely wrong on these because it's Thailand and there's difference in business and operation. So this is just a, a, a cookie cutter to what's happened in, in legalization across states in different countries. So it's just kind of interesting facts to share and to understand. Here's some, some testing recommendations. You have residual solvents. This is more for an extract form. This isn't really going to come into play if flour is the only thing that's allowed. Um, recommendation for microbials. The biggest issue in Thailand is going to be this 90% humidity. This 90% humidity is going to call mold and mildew and it's not good to combust mold or mildew. It's not good to smoke it. It's not good to eat it. It's not good to touch it and it can cause lung issues. So mold and mildew is going to be the number one issue. And typically in the United States, one of the largest issues is people don't build enough drying capacity. They build a ton of grow. They grow all these acres and hectares of outdoor. And then all of a sudden it's raining. And when it rains in Thailand, I mean, it pours because it's, it's, it's very aggressive rain. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada. It just doesn't work like that there. Um, so when people are, are harvesting these large, large fields and it starts raining, starts pouring, if they can't get their product dry fast enough, mold, mold spores will just start spreading everywhere. And it'll kill crops, it'll destroy companies, uh, and most importantly, it's very dangerous. So mold and mildew, powdery mildew are going to be the biggest issues. And then another one is uh, heavy metals. Heavy metals can, can become an issue with different soils, with different substrates, with different nutrients. So it's something to always be looking at. 
One of the biggest things here is myclobutanol. Myclobutanol is a pesticide. Here's the pesticides that we recommend. These track back to about 900 different products sold in America. I haven't done the analysis back in Thailand yet, but I will get my team working on it. But myclobutanol, once that gets concentrated at a high, high enough amount, can combust into a cyanide gas. So that's not a good thing that you want, right? Myclobutanol is for mold or powdery mildew. Um, and that's something that is going to be very common here. So it's just something that you kind of watch out for. And then as well as potency, you know, is another great thing. Testing for THC, CBD, Delta-9 versus Delta-8. There is a difference. Delta-8 is about 25% less effective as Delta-9. And then THCA is the raw form. So THCA doesn't even activate until it's carbo decarboxylated. So it has to be heated up. So there's some different factors here because THC is not just one compound. THC is actually broken down by about five different compounds. So it's something that it's, it's good to know and, and, and understand, especially when you're combusting. And then just fi final kind of overview. Um, we're going to share some industry best practices. So the wheel doesn't have to be reinvented. It's already been reinvented 23 times in the U.S. Canada, <laughs> Portugal, Israel, UK, Germany, France. Um, and a lot of times it's great to just have that information. Every state I went into, I met with all the regulatory advisory commissions, I met with all the Department of Health, the governor, and we would sit down and go through these best practices. And the states that adopted them faster had a more successful industry than states that just kind of went their own way. And then all of a sudden there was this crazy rule or regulation that completely choked and bottlenecked it. And then they're trying to understand why Colorado had a much higher uh, uh, tax revenue than, than Washington, and one has a larger illicit market than the other. So it's very, very unique, some of these factors and some of these things. But you know, thank you for, for uh, allowing me here. Uh, appreciate it. I'm excited, excited to get involved and, and consult and work with cannabis companies here and teach best practices that I've learned from US. And there's a lot of learning uh, that happens in cannabis. It costs me $17 million in learning mistakes uh, in this space. And if you don't have access to capital and you have a significant learning mistake, you're out of business. And that could be a massive issue. So the goal is to help people, help people grow, help, help people understand cultivation methodology, help understand curing, drying practices uh, that are going to help bolster and boost the entire economy as a whole. So we want to see this, this, this 487,000 jobs created. We want to see 129 billion bought in tax, you know, revenue increase off a new market that, that just came very, very rapidly. And we want to see an increase in, in overall well-being of the Thai people and uh, the legalization of cannabis be prosperous across the world. So thank you for you know, taking the leap and, and, and setting, the, setting the new precedent out here. It's, it's incredible, and uh, it goes down in history. So really appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> so Thailand's got its work cut out. <laughs> Kitty, you've been involved in this for such a long time. Um, you know, you, the, the law is obviously something you've wanted, the change in the law. But I know you've got a lot of things to think of, you a lot of observations about how things are going in Thailand. Hi. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Kitty Chopaka. Um, I would say I think I've been in the space for, I think, before it actually been brought up as an election policy. Um, way before um, there was even um, meetings in Parliament to discuss whether medical cannabis would be one of the things that um, they should think about legalizing. Um, but from throughout my years of advocating and trying to share knowledge, I would always tell people that the problem with cannabis in Thailand is got nothing to do with cannabis. Um, and there's only three things that's pretty much hinders it. Um, one is the lack of knowledge. Two is the systematic problem that Thailand has. And three, nepotism and corruption. It's the usual. Um, but while I can't actually do anything about the number two and the three, all I can do is pretty much is 
make sure that people don't lack that knowledge, um, making sure that people have a little bit of better understanding um, of what cannabis is and also like what is responsible use, what is safe use, um, as well as to support who's ever within the community that big or small, um, I answer every single people's question. I try my best anyway. I actually don't get paid to do this, um, but it just seems like it's the right thing to do. Um, so I would say that like from the 9th of June, it feels like we won. We won kind of like by a foul, by a technical foul where the other team got late to the game and they got disqualified. So right now we have the trophy, but we don't know whether that trophy is gonna get taken back or not. So let's see. But um, I actually have only three things that um, I would like to say about what's going on, what's happening. Um, and one of them, and I feel that it's the most important right now, is safe and responsible use. I understand that the health ministry cannot promote um, recreational use or smoking, but at the same time, by not giving the public information, they would not know what to do. Like, think about it. If you keep on telling them, just say no, or don't do it wrong, or don't do this, without telling them how to do it, what are you going to expect? They are people. And this actually kind of opens up for, um, for people to other people who are non-users to look at cannabis the wrong way. Um, there's going to be a lot of new users that are coming in. Um, and without this type of information of how to use it correctly, maybe edibles is not a good thing to start with. Maybe smoking is a safer way as an initiation. Or maybe it is using vaporizers. That type of thing needs to be discussed. And also for safe use, a conversation between those who use and those that doesn't use also needs to be discussed. In my household, there's only four people. Two kids, myself and my husband. I am the minority in my household. I'm the only one who use. So we have a way of managing how we keep cannabis, what I discuss with the children, how I explain to them what type is for what use, what they, you know, answer all the questions that they have. A lot of time they just want to know what it is and then, and then like two seconds later they run off. But that needs to be discussed, that needs to be talked with, because I do feel that with that discussion, I can pretty much leave it lying around the house, knowing my kids wouldn't touch it knowing that you know, they know exactly where my cannabis brownie is, but they wouldn't touch it because they know that it's not for them. It's no different than tiramisu with coffee. There's no different than other cakes with alcohol. There are ways that we know how to manage all of these things, even like toilet cleaners. There is a way to do that. This is nothing new. So right now I feel that Without this information, the public is going to become anti-cannabis because they don't know. And you can't expect them to not fear what they don't know. So that's one of my key points. Um, as to number two, I feel like right now we don't have the support as a small business as to what would be the standards and the procedure. Because we did manage to, um, the cannabis was delisted, there was no rules. I was the first one at my shop to, you know, have a guard in front of it. I actually don't allow anyone under 20 to come in, or, and I don't sell to pregnant or breastfeeding mothers from the initially. Um, also for public consumption, as well as anyone who just comes in and go, what is your highest THC? So that is, I feel that because there's no rules, we as a seller, we as entrepreneur has to come up with our rules and actually trying to set standards for what is kind of ethically required for this new industry. 
Um, I feel that because there's no rules, it also opens up to bad players to come in, to, you know, to annoy us in the people who's actually looking at doing this the long run, making it sustainable, also spread the wealth, and as well as decentralize, you know, the power of cannabis to not just have it be just in Bangkok. It should go everywhere. It shouldn't just be at like major tourist countries, I'm going, tourist cities and whatnot. So I feel that that is also something that one needs to look at. License should also be accessible. License should also be easy to get. Um, but at the same time, I do understand that there, there needs to be rules. I'm telling you now, I want rules. I want rules that make sense. Because if the rule that doesn't make sense, just as Cameron said, people are just not going to do it. It's the same as taxes. If you're just going to throw like 40%, 50% taxes on it, that ain't going to make sense. And people are going to go back to the underground. So all of this is new. There's like, you know, set new standards. There's also need, we need support in proper R&D for new products to come out. Because to tell you the truth, the stuff that's in market right now is quite crap. Um, so yeah, like we really need to look at this properly. And lastly, I feel like we're not being supportive enough to the local guys, to the local growers, to the local players, to the people who were prosecuted initially, who are now about to go into new industry, um, about to go into new career. The yesterday dealers are now the today bud tender. The yesterday, um, you know, um, delivery kids is now the today security armored van guy. So like all of this is here. We need to support them. And right now, to tell you the truth, what I see is all around, <laughs> what I actually see is that um, there's a lot of bad players who are illegally importing in cannabis from the US, from Canada. And a lot of them are PGR, which is plant growth regulators um, cannabis. So it's kind of like use a lot of chemicals in there and it's no different than the brick weed that we get from Laos. And it is the weirdest thing to actually have it to this day that it changed, everything changed. Back in the days, in the 70s, Thailand was the illegal importers, uh, exporters of cannabis into the US. Now today, it's the US that are importing illegally into Thailand. And they are taking money and the benefits that the people who were fighting for this, who were growing this before illegally, who actually has all the knowledge to kind of make this industry happen. Like, no offense on Cameron's behalf, but at the same time, it's not like cannabis has never been grown here. It's not like we don't have an industry here before. It's just that it was illegal and we never actually had the chance to actually do anything with it. So maybe this is the time to let us show um, and maybe listen to us a little bit. Thank you. We've covered a lot of ground. That's fantastic. Thank you, Kitty. Um, Tom, you, you, you said to me earlier, you said, oh, by the time everyone else has spoken, <laughs> they'll have said everything you want to say. But I've never known you to be lost for words. And you are, this is your fault. I mean, this, this whole, it's your policy. Yours and Kunanitin. So, come on, you tell us what you think about it. Well, Katie started with hi, right? Let's go hi, right? Everybody thinks how cannabis is, right? Hi, right? Um, I feel kind of funny because he says on his left is the guy he hates the most. If you ask her, to her right is the guy she hates the most. <laughs> Three years. Well, I don't remember that, that we were here, right? Three years. You wore a very loud shirt. I did, huh? I tried to dress for you because I want to honor the FCCT. I'll, I'll help promote you. you know, if you're not a member, sign up. Okay. Uh, three years. Well, that, that, that has been a long time. Um, bad. Bad. This thing is horrible. It will kill you. It is terrible. This little plant, right? <laughs> Damn it, good. That's good. Right? It's legal. Let's drink the hell out of it. Right? Even better. 
This is good too, right? Right? And to me, my wife says, this will give you cancer, Tom. Why don't you quit? Right? This will give you liver disease, right? This will cause drunk driving. This thing will just kind of put you to sleep. Right? This thing will help what everybody has already said. I had a fr I'll tell you why I got into the cannabis business. I had a friend named Chris, and he was stage four cancer. And he went through 86 chemo, okay? And he just got tired. He says, I'm going to die, because I'd rather die than continue to do chemo. So we put him on a regimen of CBD, full spectrum, and also THC, okay? We saw two things that happened to Chris immediately. One, he regained his appetite, because most cancer patients just won't eat. Two, it helped him with his nausea. When you get a lot of chemo, you get nauseated, right? <laughs> I'm proud to say, Chris is clean. Chris is clean, right? I have a friend whose kid has autism, shakes. It's not firing at all cylinders. The young man is on a CBD, high potency, a little bit of THC. The kid leads a normal life now. Tell me one thing, medically, that this stuff does for you. You know, I always say, right, smoking a cigarette will give you lung cancer, right? Smoking weed helps cure that lung cancer, right? There's nothing a lot I can say that has already not been covered. Everything that's positive in this world, there is a negative, and it's about usage. It's about usage. It's about, in a Thai, it's called Chai Sati. Right? You know, chai sati means, you know, think before you jump. Got to maintain that level. Three years, four years ago, I remember when Kunanutin said that he wanted to legalize cannabis. I asked him flat out, why do you want to do it? And he says, all the research shows that this helps more than it hurts. Does it hurt? Well, you know, everybody asked me, can you die from cannabis? I want everybody who asked that question to Google it now, right? Google, can you die from cannabis? Every search engine will come back and say no. You know why? Because you will fall asleep before you die, right? Can you OD from eating a cookie, right? From eating a cake? Yeah, but you'll OD long before you die. I've never seen one death. Cameron, can you confirm that? And everyone that we've tracked back is always had something else in it. Right. Every single time. What about drunk driving, Tom? I have a business in Las Vegas, right? The number of drunk driving death in Vegas went down 18% when they would legalize cannabis. Do you know why? Because if you smoke weed, you can't get to the car. <laughs> You're gonna pretty much hang out, right? Since cannabis was legalized on June 9th by Kunanutin, the fear mongers, Thailand's gonna turn into a you know, smog of green weed. Everywhere we go, we're gonna smell weed. Have you really seen that? Do you know why? Because people who smoke cannabis, use cannabis, they do it usually privately. They don't go around the street, they don't walk around, they don't smoke. They sit down, they relax, and they do it. All right? Kids are going to die. None have yet. Is it dangerous to kids? Sure. And as everybody in this panel agreed, there should be rules and laws. But I'm gonna tell you why I don't think that it was necessary to do it before June 9th, because there were already laws on the books. There's a public nuisance law. Can't smoke in public, right? It's, the law was there. There was directives already. You can't sell things to kids that, that are a vice. The law was already there. You can't actually just put up a table on Khao San Road and sell because there's a law against people opening up businesses without license. And I go back to Kitty's point. Why do you always need the government to tell you something? Kitty knows better. I know better. I have a clinic on Soy 13, right? We dispense only if you come and get a doctor's um, license. Right? Kitty's right. 
She doesn't sell to 20 year olds. She didn't have to wait for the government to tell her that. Right? Most dispensaries that I know of, people who were underground and now are above ground, they know already. Self-regulation has always been there. So when people attack Kununati and of like, why didn't you come up with the laws? Laws are all in the books. And there's always one best law, law of logic. No cannabis business, I'm sorry, no business in this world of anyone who wants to make money would want to hurt the customer. Well, that'd be really smart. Let's kill everybody while we're selling stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the tobacco company. They do that, don't they? Right? Beer companies in Thailand, right? Lao Kao, you guys know what Lao Kao is? Try drinking that or smoking one weed. What is gonna drop you for quicker? So again, I'm encouraged by what has happened since the 9th. I'm encouraged. I've seen people now who come to our clinic, I've seen people who go to Chopika's dispensary. They go in with the mindset of using cannabis for a specific purpose, to relax. The number one killer, is anybody aware what the actually number one killer is? Stress. Stress will kill you faster than everything. By the way, the second, num the second biggest killer, and it's legal, and you can buy it in a supermarket, is sugar. I don't see that being regulated. I have diabetes, I'm regulated by my wife. <laughs> nothing is all good. But then in reverse, nothing is all bad. Thailand has made a decision to be not an Asian country, the first country, the first country in the world that has taken the cannabis plant off the narcotics list. The United States doesn't do it, Canada doesn't do it, Portugal doesn't do it, Europe doesn't do it. Okay? What does that really mean? It means that people, and I thank Gloria for this because she hit the nail on the head. When Kunanuchin and I started working on this literally four years ago, I never even figured that there would be a side reward to this, which is people were gonna get out of jail. I never thought of that until it actually happened. Fathers are being returned to their children. Mothers can now go back and hug their kids. First petty crime, like you know, having an ounce of cannabis. People are getting out of jail. I hope that the United States with a jail population of a tremendous amount will see that it's silly to put people in jail for trying to do something good for their health. Over 4,000, 4,000, 4, right, Gloria? 4,000 people immediately were released. 10,000 records were wiped out. These people can now start a new life. Cameron has talked about the business aspect of it. I am fully for taxing. You want to control it? Do it two ways. I call it the two T's, testing and taxing. But you do it at a level, what, Ki what, what Kitty said. You don't do it at a level where it actually drives people to the underground company. There's no reason why Thailand should not be taxing cannabis. There's no reason why Thailand should not be testing for cannabis. There is no reason why you should be afraid of this plant. There's no reason why. It's a first step. I appreciate what Kunaritin said. By the way, I was in the meeting with him when it was discussed of whether or not we should delay this. And I will guarantee you right now, at that meeting, he said exactly the same thing. The damage should have been more than the benefits because he truly believed. And he said this. I want to paraphrase you, okay? He says, I believe in Thai people. He said this. Tom, Thai people are going to know what to do. Will there be some bad actors? Of course. But in general, I appreciate the Thai people. That's what he said. They're going to know how to consume it because as Katie said, cannabis is not new. It's been around for a long time. They're going to know how to use it and they're going to be logical about it. So with that, we legalized it. New laws are going to be in place. Right now, I think the people have controlled it very nicely. I truly agree with Kitty. The Thai farmers should grow. However, there's only one major problem. Yes, we have grown a lot in Thailand.
no doubt. But we haven't grown to the quality that is medicinal or to the point of where it should be used. We will get there. We will get there. Chinese, there's 330 million of them just right above us. Indians, Middle Eastern, they're all gonna come here. They're all gonna come here for a very simple reason. Because they can go to sleep, they can cure chronic pain, they can help with, by the way, one thing I will say right now, it doesn't cure cancer. Anybody who tells you that is lying to you. It helps with the disease. Like I said, it makes it you eat. It helps you with nausea. But there are so many diseases, right, that it will help. We will be the medical hub of cannabis. For example, I'll give you one product that I will show you right now. Do you guys know Sing Pio Oil? This is the number one oil in Thailand. With the legalization of this law, we have taken a Thai product, added CBD to it, right? And not only are we gonna sell it here in Thailand, but we're gonna ship this around the world where CBD is legal. So it's not only an import issue, it's an export issue. Thai herbal is really, really good. I'm currently working with Kankan University to figure the ultimate sleep aid. And I just found out that there's an herb in Thailand that really helps you sleep. It's called Kilek. <laughs> Kilek. We added Kilek to cannabis, and it knocked me out. We're gonna be pharmaceutical, okay? So with all of that, um, it's not as bad as you think, right? It's not as bad as you think. There you go, right? It's not as bad as you think. It's a choice. You don't have to use it. One of the fallacy was once you legalize cannabis, everybody will smoke weed. Nobody will go to work on Monday. Alcohol has been legalized for hundreds of years. I don't drink. Cigarettes have been, are legalized. I don't smoke, I smoke a cigar, right? Because of Dan over there, that's my cigar dealer, right? The number of usage will not increase as people think. If you haven't tried cannabis, try it. You probably won't like it. The odds are good, right? But if you have a disease, if you're sick, if you can't sleep and you try it and it helps you go to bed, believe me, it'll be the best thing you ever try. It's a ton load better than that chemically induced thing called melatonin, okay? And remember, forget the economic benefits of it. Forget everything else. Could you imagine if you can grow your own medicine in your own backyard? Think about that. You can now legally, legally grow your own medicine to help with chronic pain, to help with insomnia in your backyard. Gloria, thank you. You're absolutely right. The police will not come knocking down your door and arrest you. We just let 5,000 people out. We don't want any more in jail. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna open up to questions, right, John? Absolutely, Tom. Listen, um, thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> It's a good sales pitch. Um, That's it? That's the applause I get? Come on! <laughs> they're, there is, they're, they're not drunk enough yet. They're, they're not stoned enough yet. <laughs> they're not stoned enough yet. There you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you are going to smoke, Before we go, one, one balconies thing. out there. One, one thing. One of the ways to control children is to put it in bags like this. Right? In America, you have to put in bags like this. John, try opening that quicker. Right? I'm 56. I still don't know how to open the darn bag. It's horrible. This is control. Listen, there's a microphone there. If you, I would like to prioritize working journalists. There are journalists who've got questions. But basically, if you want to ask questions to anyone on the panel, come up to the microphone. Identify yourselves. Um, one question only, please. Make them clear and short. Um, also identify who you're directing the question to. Um, off you go. Don't be shy. Leka. I thought you might be the first. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Leka Shankar. I write for a newspaper in India. Um, I, I wanted to focus on the tourism angle. Maybe uh, this could be answered by the health minister. Um, uh, you, all of you spoke of promoting Thailand as a medical hub, but right now, tourism hub is, is the big word. And both for the outgoing tourist 
everybody who's coming from Thailand is going to be suspect. This morning there was the report of this young boy being arrested in Indonesia because he carried a lot of cannabis from Thailand. And for the inbound, I'm particularly interested in the Indian tourism market because that's big now. And um, they're not going to come to Bangkok to sleep. They're going to come to Bangkok to have a lot of fun. And uh, just right outside an Indian restaurant yesterday, I saw a cannabis dispensary. And it said, weed, food, and beer. So th this is going to be big for them. It's not going to make the family market you know, particularly happy, or the wedding market, or even the government. So I was just worried on that angle. Before the laws and regulations really come into place, this is going to make a big impact in the tourism market, both for the outbound from Thailand and for the inbound. And I was wondering whether you thought of that and how you could uh, set a balance. Thank you. Could I need any, uh, yeah. Well, as I said, the law, uh, the regulations of freeing cannabis has come this far because we started off by encouraging the use of cannabis on health and medical purposes. So I think it is very clear because it, in that side of the street, people are very well aware uh, of the uh, usefulness of these products. Well, in terms of tourism, of course, we don't want Thailand to be known by the foreigners you know, going to the tourist counters and you know, seeing the sign that let's come to Thailand, go to Ko Pangan, go to Ko Samui, where you can, or go to Kano, Tano, uh, Khao San Road, where you can freely smoke weed. I cannot allow that to happen for now until we are able to find certain regulations to control these activities. So that's why we have certain regulations and also the law that, I that is being drafted. And I, I would not say the draft that has been uh, accepted, but uh, the law that is being amended in the House right now will collect all the information about this and try to come up with a doable solutions in which uh, all concerned parties can, can, can be satisfied with uh, what is going to come out. Kunan I just wanted to pick up on a point there. I mean, you're the Minister of Health and your focus is obviously on the, on the <laughs> medical benefits and that's been a big part of it. But do you accept that, that it's quite difficult to draw a line, that if you, ha if you promote medical use and therapeutical uses, there will be some recreational use too, that that's inevitable. And the question ultimately is just how you regulate that. As I said, you know, being the Minister of Health and the reason why I was able to advocate my people to agree on this policy. Uh, I could only tell them that we focus on the purposes that I just mentioned. Recreational use is as what Kunkidis mentioned. If you understandably decide to consume uh, these products, you must have enough knowledge and you must have certain discipline. And, you know, all data and information have to be on the street where people know as to how far they can go. Because, again, recreational use is beyond my purposes. So, I would say that, but because we, we, I have to free these products as promised, 
during my campaign for the use of medical purposes and health care, then uh, the the byproduct of that will have to be uh, controlled with other uh, other uh, rules, and it is good in a way that the law that was supposed to be finished in line with the date of uh, taking off cannabis from the narcotic list. We had COVID. Then the House had to postpone the consideration. But I think we, it is a blessing in disguise that now all the uh, legislators are now listening to our concerns. And I had uh, collected some information from this panel, and I will feed it, feed this information to them in order to make sure that uh, they will put together and amend the law to the point that uh, it could it it could make all parties moving on with this. Thank you very much, Konanitin. Do we have any other questions? Hello. Okay. So uh, My name is P. K. Pascal Manasrikul. I'm a chairman of Creative Economies at Kla Party. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Uh, sorry, Mr. John, they'll be really quickly. And they uh, are targeted to most to uh, His Excellency Kunanutin uh, Nakap. First question would be um, in terms of the agronomic uh, perspective, why do you limit to only six plants? That's just out of curiosity. And to my second question, uh, His Excellency has talked a lot about health. And as a student of psychology, I'm just a little bit curious about uh, how has the public health ministry uh, prepare for uh, perhaps uh, psychological effects of marijuana. Uh, I've, read up, I've read some of it online and, I've, I, and I know there is a correlation between uh, marijuana consumption, whether recreational or not, uh, with uh, mental health uh, issues. And I just wanted to know how the public minister, the public health ministry is preparing for that. Thank you. Okay, first question. There's no longer six plans. Uh, According to the current uh, regulations, you can grow as many as you want. But I heard from the, those legislators that in the law, they might increase up to 20 plants per household. But that's not, that is only household use. If you ever want to uh, make revenue out of it. You can also, you can grow as many as you want to, but you have to register yourself with the, the Prukan application, which links you directly to the FDA. And then you only state your purpose of why you will grow 50,000 plants. Normally, nobody would give you 20 seeds in the market, I mean, would, would sell 20 seeds in the market. I saw uh, in the, uh, the, the medical herb fair this morning, people put in plastic bags. I, I, I could count, if I could count it, it probably be up to 50,000 seeds per bag. And it's, it is sold at about 1,000, no, sorry, 15,000 baht per kilo. So that is when people want to make it as business, not in the household. So for the time being, you, there is no longer uh, limitation uh, the, per household in terms of plantation. Second questions that you uh, raised, which was related to the psychological uh, effect of people consuming cannabis. Up to now, there are all the reports that I gathered, because every time when there was things like this, the 
mental health department director general would always come to my office and try to excuse herself that it's not psychological. These people consume other things. They went for Yaba, prior to smoking this joint, and they collapsed from the other stuff. And I think uh, our friends here on this panel had just uh, confirmed this information. There hasn't been a case where people intentionally, especially people who are prescribed for using cannabis, would have side effects from, from the treatment. Or even people, if you remember, when our governor came in on the first day in office, one of the Bangkok hospitals that belongs to his supervision reported that there was a death case in the hospital. And this guy consumed marijuana. And once, when people were so, were so uh, panic about this information, or then the investigation moved on, and it was proven that the guy died from other cases. And the last time that he consumed marijuana was weeks or months ago. So uh, then I, I think my answer to you is we haven't been reported about the death or any uh, adverse effect from consuming marijuana or consuming cannabis products directly. Cameron, perhaps we could ask, I mean, obviously the US is well ahead of Thailand, I mean, have there been serious health issues related to the legalization of marijuana in, in the states in the US where it's happened? They were really worried about increases in DUIs, drunken driving, drug driving, that has not increased. It has not been a, a, a driver. I've got all the stats and facts to it. Um, you know, some of the issues have been, you know, at worst, something called cannabis hypermesis. And all that is, is you're consuming a lot. It, I mean, a lot every single day for a very extended part of time. And you just get sick to your stomach. And you go to the hospital, you get an IV, and you come back, and they say, slow it down. So that's, that's really been the big ones. Um, as far as the um, uh, uh, psych, you know, psych, different psych, uh, psychotic episodes, it's, it's typically always been linked with people always having another substance or multiple substances in their body. Um, and in the regulated market, we just don't see that. So medical and recreational, we don't see an, um, any change. But now if it's illicit market, then we've seen that just because, again, there's, there's there's people mixing different things and using different things and, and not, not growing the, the plant appropriately. So, yeah. Thanks very much. Any other questions? Please. Uh, Jay Harriman, Bauer Group Asia, business advisory firm. Um, so I want to thank the FCT, FCCT for hosting the event and also thank the guests for, honorable guests for joining us this evening. Uh, my question is perhaps best for Minister Anutin. Uh, now that uh, Boom Jai Thai has fulfilled uh, its biggest campaign promise, uh, what will be the newest or next flagship policy that the party will promote uh, as we head into the campaign and election season? <laughs> and if you, you can't give us the details, maybe you could let us know what, what you're thinking and generally about uh, policy. So Thanks. what could top cannabis as, a, as an election campaign? Why all the questions fall on me? You know something? I'm leaving. <laughs> well, thank you. I think uh, the next policy, of course, will be the continuity of, you know, we still have quite a distance to go in before, you know, uh, making this cannabis totally uh, free and safe. Uh, the second issue is very important to me. Now it is free, but there are still concerns that whether it is safe or not. But, and as I said, the, the safety of people uh, definitely is definitely uh, 
our biggest concern. So we, have, we will have to continue to make sure that the new law that comes out will provide a certain authority. Let's say, for example, there might be another commission under this law to make sure that should there be any abrupt problems along the way, then these committees will be able to uh, you know, uh, intervene and try to uh, resolve the problems. So uh, another part, Bhum Jai Thai Party is, is a handy party. We have the slogan, we do quick and we do, fa uh, uh, we do advance. Most of our uh, MPs are from the constituency and they stick their heads shoulder to shoulder with the people. So we concentrated on everything con uh, concerning well-being of the people. So for now, when I have a chance to be responsible at, at the health ministry, almost three and a half years already. I wish I, this government will be able to f complete its term. Given the current situation, uh, we haven't foreseen any uh, uh, obstacles that will, uh, will not allow us to, to, to go to the, to go to the, the, the final episode of this administration. Uh, there, there, there are many things for health issues. We have modified and um, uh, enlarged the scale of national health security, the coverage that we have uh, given to the people. Uh, we have to, to increase uh, as much coverage as we, as many coverage as we are able to do. And also, uh, in terms of strengthening the economy, I and the Minister of Transportation, during the COVID, we never stopped pushing all the infrastructural projects of the government to move on. Because during the COVID time, that is the only stream of income that can make people, can make the business, underlying business, uh, can, can, can create cash flow. And I think we, we will have to focus on, on this issue as well. Uh, sometimes when we, we are at this situation. We will have to see that uh, all the basic infrastructure has been taken care of, all the basic needs of the people has been taken care of, all the laws have been loosened in order to, for the people to, to uh, conduct their business without any uh, discrepancies. So, as I said, to, to, to answer your question, we only focus on well-being of the people and that is, uh, it is the limit in the sky. So it's time for us to, to uh, fix the country's problem and then move on with, with the short-term, middle-term and long-term plan in the way forward. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions? Yes, please. Here we go. Okay, so Tom, I don't want you leaving us yet. So we'll, we'll direct the question your Thank way. You. It's Thank the first, you. Absolutely. Hey, it's the first time I've had the pleasure of hearing you speak, and you're a straight shooter in a world that a lot of people can, love. Can you identify yourself? Watching. We know sure. Tom, sorry. Sure, no, no problem. Andrew Simon. That's actually my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I should have guessed. You just look like me. I was going to say the resemblance is remarkable. That's it. But, okay, but a uh, question for you. So if I can ask you a straight question okay. for a straight shooter. Sure. So we're talking a lot about the potential pros and cons 
mostly pros for tourism. And particularly, you know, talking about them coming in from China, coming in from other demographics. But we're already seeing uh, China telling tourists, if you consume marijuana while you're in Thailand, you will face criminal persecution when you come back. And we're seeing that sort of rhetoric. I, I think it's maybe one of the challenges of being a prime mover, where we don't, ne where we're maybe a little bit unique in where we're going. And I think that's going to possibly present some ch new challenges. So, from your perspective, when we look at that kind of a hardline stance that's still static in many of the surrounding company countries, where we do generate a lot of our tourism from. How do you see potentially mitigating that, working through that, and maybe dealing with some competing interests moving forward? Super. I, I haven't seen that with China. Has China yeah. actually said that? There's actually only one country in the world that I know of that will piss test you, that they have the right to, if you go to a country that has weed or cannabis or anything else, and that's Japan. Right? Japan can actually pull you over and do a drug test or a piss test on you, right? Every other country, I've never heard that from China. I haven't heard it yet. But, um, you know, if you ask me a question, I, I don't see that happening even in Japan. It's not a real law yet. It's just something that they maybe may or may not do. Um, there's been reports this morning, there was a Palang Pacharat MP who said, this is going to be negative for tourism. I think I need to give her some weed or she's been smoking some really weird stuff. Because I don't see how this is going to be negative towards tourism, right? I think there are rules and laws that we have to put in place. I actually recommended to the minister, and we're taking this action next week, that every airport counter has to ask you the exact same question as whether or not you're carrying a battery pack onto the plane. They will start asking whether or not you have cannabis in your, in your, in your, in your thing. To the lady's point, the gentleman in Indonesia was not carrying a lot of cannabis. He was just carrying a little bit. I spoke to the ambassadors of Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia. I was very clear. Will you kill me if I carry weed into Malaysia or Singapore? The answer was, you have to be, it's two different issues. There's distribution and consumption. If you have the intent to distribute, yes, you will have the full law of those countries against you. If you go in and there's consumption and you don't do it every five days when you come to Thailand, you will be fine. In Singapore, I think it was like 20,000 um, Singaporean or something like that. Uh, to answer your question, I haven't heard that. I don't think that's going to be a real issue. But if it is, it's something we should look at. And that's something that our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Kundal, whenever he wakes up, um, should have a discussion with these foreign countries to explain to them what our objectives are. You know, I don't think China will regulate its people to come here and be cured. It's not in the interest of their country to stop people from being sick. Uh, but it's, it's a good point. It's something that, again, each country has a right to do. Uh, but I don't see it. I just can't see it. And if somebody can show me you know, how this is going to be negative on tourism, I'd like to see it. Because America, you know, I have businesses in Sacramento, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. And believe me, and I say this with all truthfulness. There are buses. There are buses that do nothing but medical marijuana um, things to Los Angeles, to Las Vegas, because people are getting cured. But again, um, I, Jonathan, have you heard that about China? Um, I hadn't. I can believe yeah. it. But it doesn't seem very enforceable uh, to me either. Uh, I'm going to have to give Xi Jinping a call and have, her, and have him figure this one. I, I haven't heard it, my friend. I appreciate the question. It's a good point. I don't think it's going to be a negative. Um, as we move along, well, 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 remember what Kunanutin said? I just want to point this. I never thought of that, what his answer was. You know, a lot of people are nailing people like me or people like that. Why didn't you have a law in place before cannabis was legalized? Never thought of what he said. Could you imagine if we actually had a law before that was solid and we didn't answer all the questions that are being asked now? Think about that a little bit. That's actually a very good answer. Now, he has to listen to Kitty. He has to listen to um, Gloria, to Cam, to Chatat, right? It's hard to listen to him because he's always running, right? But we have to listen to people. Isn't that a better way of doing things? 
to listen, to think, to make the right rules and laws rather than coming up with, because remember, once it's a law in Thailand, it is difficult to change. It's called Prachabanyat, royal decree. Try changing that one. So again, think about this a little bit. That's a really good point. You will get a good law because Kunar Chin actually listened to Kitty on this one. He was telling me, she makes a lot of sense, right? So going back, if that's something that you had mentioned, how we're going to work with the foreign countries, that's a good point. So I think we're in a period, by September, you're gonna see some real regulations that will help ease some of your concerns, your concerns. But remember, this is the first time ever in Thailand where if you light this up, outside, outside please, okay, you will not go to jail. Well, you can go outside. <laughs> Somebody has to tell you that it's a new, no, okay, let's be clear on the law. I'm Mr. Law on this. In reality, people, you can light it up in here. But if it bothers her, there's already a law on the books, which is public nuisance. She can tell the police and they will arrest you for public nuisance. The laws are always on the book. Now we're just going to make it better. How? By listening by working, by bringing in people like Cam, by bring, listening to people. I agree with, and I, I Minister, I, I, I can't say this enough. You have got to listen to the underground people. Let them come and help you. They know what needs to be done because they are an advocate. Kitty is an advocate of cannabis ever since I met her. We're gonna listen, we're gonna draft the right things and you won't go to jail, okay? Unless you go to Singapore with a dozen doobies is not a good thing. Hope that answered your question, my friend. Thank you for asking. I feel so honored I was asked a question. Look, I'm, I, the minister has to go back to the house to vote, I understand, so his time is up. So I'm going to wrap up this evening. Good. We covered a huge amount of ground, but please give a warm round of applause to all of our participants for this discussion. By the way... Even though he has to hurry back, I'm telling you right now, if you want to take a picture with him, do it. He's the most normal guy in the world. If you want to take a selfie with him, do it, okay? But remember, he just had COVID. <laughs> but he's cured, he's cured. By the way, anybody want this flower, it's yours.